Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome, welcome. Fourth day of March. This, this year seems like it's going fast, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm just chilling right now. I'm getting a lot of stuff situated. Working on my Kickstarter campaign. Getting that situated. Um, took care of some information that my manager will need to take care of for as for my motivational speaking, which I'm about to get into more of, I should say, and just preparing. And I thought about some things last night, and I wanted to do this uh, episode last night, so I was like, you know, I'm just going to do it today and stay focused. So basically, I want to talk about is When the Bell Rings, the documentary, and, you know, I had an outstanding interview with Malcolm Riddle on American Riddle yesterday, which was very phenomenal. It was a, it was a good experience just talking with them and seeing what they feel about how they felt about the documentary, how they felt about the journey and everything that I went through during that. And as I reflect on the past and I think about it, I'm like, man, this was a, it was a, very daunting and eye-opening process knowing that I started being a chunky dude with the vision of getting back into the ring to try to grab what I used to have in the 90s. That's a feat in itself. Not being in my kid's life because I'm a journeyman and bouncing around trying to make ends meet, doing stuff to get myself to that next level of my to my goal to uh, complete my goal my mission so doing that and thinking about all the people that came in and out my life all the women that was say they were supportive but wasn't all the friends and associates that say they were they were supportive you know i only have a handful of friends that actually really supports my entire journey just a handful and if you heard something in the background, excuse me, I have the plumbers here fixing the water heater, so they're uh, doing their thing right now. So I think they're walking outside the house making that noise. Anyway, so to touch bases on the process of when the bell rings, it was an eye-opening experience for me. It took a lot for me to stick with it. And not give up because I really don't give up on anything. You know, if I even if it seemed like I give I've given up on something, I really didn't. I'm just restructuring myself and move back forward for to attain whatever goal that was. When I met Brad Boris on the Spirit Awards, I really didn't believe him in the beginning that he would take on my career, my life and just film it. Because, you know, I had people in my past that lied to me, said they they was going to help me and they was going to shoot my documentary or they didn't have time to do it or they wasn't going to make time to do it. And they said they wasn't going to do nothing for free or whatever the case may be. So, you know, I'm not making it a race thing, white or black or whatever. But I went to a couple of my black peers and they didn't have time for me. I went to a couple of my white friends they had time, but they wanted money. Or they didn't They didn't have the money, but they had the time, but they just didn't want to, or vice versa, I should say. They just, or they just had other things going on. They was just tick, saying that they would do it to make me feel good, but then when they get down to let's do it, they wasn't really down for it. So that's what, you know, made me, led me to f- feel some type of way on my journey before leading up to meeting Brad and getting on a Film Independent Spirit Awards. Being on a Spirit Awards was, was great, you know. Got a chance to mingle, interact with people, telling Brad my story. And as I'm telling Brad my life story, you know, I cry from time to time during lunch or I remember I drive to Home Depot getting sandbags and telling him my story and how tired I was grabbing those sandbags them 50, 40 pound sandbags, just grabbing them sandbags and filling the cart up with it. And then we got to transfer the bags from the cart 
to the, to the van. So you take the, the the sand from where the sand is at and put it on the little cart, and then push the cart to the van. Then take the sandbags and the cart to the van. That was rough, you know. And we had like a hundred of them bags, or more maybe. But we needed it for the Spirit Awards because it was a storm coming. They, you know, we had to sandbag down the tents and things and such forth. That was an experience working at the Spirit Awards because we actually saved the Spirit Awards. Some kind of typhoon came through. And this typhoon that came through, <laughs> it kind of uh, almost destroyed the the uh, Spirit Awards that year. But we saved the Spirit Awards. Got that water out of there. It was it was interesting. That's a whole other subject. But back to the wind the bell ring thing. You know, Brad, as humble as he is, he was like, "Look, man, you find a gym, I'm gonna shoot your life story." So, as soon as we finished with the Spirit Awards, all the party festivities, you know, all the beer drinking and all the eating, binging and stuff I was doing and partying and weed smoking and all that, it I had to assess myself and I started looking for gyms. I went to one gym. It it, it was really not my type of gym cuz it was too Hollywoodish. It air conditioning um it was just it was just too clean, too smell good, didn't have the the grittiness that I'm used to in a training in a boxing gym. It was just too clean, too smell good. I'm like, really? You don't smell the blood, sweat, and tears? You don't smell just pain and agony? You don't feel the heat? It's air conditioning? It was whatever. I said, nah, I can't, I can't train in there. It's not my cup of tea. Then I went to another gym, which a guy said I was too old, you know, too fat. It's so whatever. And then I went to Wild Card Gym, which is Freddie Roach's gym. Uh, Freddie, he was already doing something with Showtime at the time, and I guess Pacquiao was doing this thing in there, and, he, and you can't have two different films. You can't film in there while they're filming and stuff. So so I couldn't, I mean, the gym was ideal. I liked the wild card gym. I liked the atmosphere, the feeling, the grittiness, all that. So wild card was cool. And I remember talking to Freddie before, I think a year prior, he was like, if I lose some weight, he will work with me, you know? And that was just, that was, the, that was like uh, two years prior to when the bell rings, but I was kind of way out of shape. then. I think I met him at a uh, event. It was in Anaheim and he was walking. And I think Michael Moore and all those out there and stuff like that. It was a lot of, uh, a lot of other boxes and things. And such. I can't remember the event though, but anyway, so I didn't do wild card. So I found this gym called Pound for Pound Boxing Gym, which is kind of Hollywood. Has celebrities there. It's not rugged, but it was it was kind of gritty. It's it's a nice gym, nice atmosphere. It didn't have the atmosphere that I really wanted, but it had industry people there training and stuff. So I was like, you know, what? I am in the biz. I can go against my standards and train at this gym. So I let me talk to the guy. So Philip Bobo uh, is a former football player. I think he's one of the managers of the gym or trainers of, trainers of the gym. Spoke with him, talked with him. Uh, Terry uh, Clyborn, I think he's the owner of the gym. Um, I didn't get a chance to work with him because he was working with a celebrity. So Philip, I talked with Philip and um Gave me a quote of what I, what I need to do to work out there. It's like $25 an hour, three or four hours a day, four days a week or something. I can't remember what it was. It was something astronomical. And I was had my girl on the phone at the time listening. And I was like, man, this is too, I, I can't afford that right now. I was, I was to the point where I was super depressed. Super depressed. And I was like, man, I can't get a gym. And I have a guy say he's going to film my journey. And he need to film this. He need to film all this. But he was working at L.A. Film Festival. So he had, you know, filming me trying to find the gym was out of it. So if I had somebody following all that process, that would have been interesting too, actually. So I'm sitting on the bus stop crying and thinking and contemplating, 
calling it the quits to life, period. Just sitting there and Philip came out and he was like, man, you all right? And I was like, yeah, man, just um, I just got a lot on my mind, man. I just, had, I just need a gym. I need to get in shape. I want to fight again. And, oh, man, keep your head up, whatever, whatever he said. And he bounced. I uh, took the bus back to Culver City, went into my room, turned on my laptop. There was a video I had there prior. It was my calling at the end video. So I did this other video, set it up, and sent it out there. But then an hour later, Philip Bobo calls me and said he has uh, someone that can train somebody my age. He trains out in Highland Park, Bob Edwards. Talk, spoke with Bob, interesting conversation, told him what I wanted, told him what I wanted to do, told him that I had somebody that was going to film me, the whole process. He said, come down to the gym. He stated the time. I said that I'll be there. It was funny, all that. He said he wanted to see how serious I was being, at that time, 40 years old. So I was 39 going on 40. At I was 39 going on 40. So the next day I came to the gym. I called Brad first. I said, Brad, I got a gym, blah, blah, blah. All right, man, I'll be there tomorrow. Got to the gym. You know, introduced myself to Bob. He had a couple of amateurs in there doing their thing. There was these triplets, three professionals there doing their thing the Weaver brothers Troy Lloyd and Floyd Weaver so I don't remember the amateur names it was just one little Hispanic kid was beast and they had these other two other kids that was not beast one of them was lazy but and, and a young lady that came through there all the time working out so um I was waiting on Brad there was no Brad Brad sent me a message saying that he was sick. He couldn't come out. And that's when I was like, oh, here's the bullshit. This, that bullshit right here. See, you know, he sends me a picture with his face looking all red, eyes puffy, no glistening under his, you know, something glistening under his nose and stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, he probably really is sick. He sent me that. So it's okay, whatever. So I trained a little bit, you know, my uh, Bob was telling me to do some running up and down his parking lot to get myself acting, run up and down his parking lot. So I did what he said. And boy, that thing kicked my behind. Brad came out the next day, still sick. He said he wanted to show me that he was serious. And then it just started from there. Every time when he finished the L.A. Film Festival, he would come out and, and he will film He'll film the whole training process, the whole training process, the whole training process. I think he was working something else, too. I think I worked the uh, Turn the Movie Classic um, Festival as well. So I didn't work the L.A. Film Festival. I did work the Spirit Awards, and I worked the Turn the Movie Classic Festival thing, TMC Festival. But I didn't work the L.A. Film Festival. And I think that worked in my favor because, like I said, I was working out with Sweet Science Boston Gym. And then Brad was filming, filming, filming. Then he started getting other work. So he'll stop filming, go do something else to make ends meet. He'll miss out some key things when I got my nose bust, uh, bust open. Brad got a chance. And he missed that. And he's like, man, man, I missed that. I missed that. Dang it. Um. Then he got, you know, he captured the footage of me being knocked out. And that's because I was over eager. You know, I wanted to get in there and see if I still had it. Because, you know, I'm going against these amateurs. And I want to see how, how can I fare versus a uh, professional fighter. And Lloyd Weaver, you know, put me to sleep. It is what it is. It made me think. I want to say, man, I've never been knocked out before. This is rough. Maybe uh, this boxing is not for me. But I was focused and I stayed focused with it. And I just continued on and on and on. Brad didn't know this is his first documentary, so he re- he was just winging it. So he broke down his schedule. What do you want to do? What you want to do with this? Uh, what you want to do with your career with this with this documentary? Man, I want to see my mom. I want to see my sister. I want to see my I want to see my my daughter. I want to see my I want to see my oldest son. I want to see my middle son. My youngest son. I want to 
closure with my father, you know, on the, it's all this. It was all in there. I wrote it all in there. And he made it happen. You know, we got on a plane. We went to Minnesota. I went to my old gym, trained out there. We went to Chicago. I trained. I couldn't. My gym was closed. So we went to the the new Windy City Gym. The old Windy City Gym is not there anymore. We trained there. I sparred Montel Griffin. Um, I saw... Uh, I can't think of his name right now. I call him the nut buster. He was big, tall. I can't remember his name. Big white guy. He was a nut. I was known for knocking people in their nuts. I can't think of his name right now. But he was there. Um, so it was just a lot of the energy was great. You know, going back in Chicago, filming the, the neighborhood where I was raised at, where I got shot at. And, you know, Brad filming all this stuff in my life, going to my old neighborhood talked to some old friends and stuff like that. Met my daughter. There was some shenanigans going on with that in Minnesota. That was in Minnesota, actually. But a lot of shenanigans with that. So we finished that, went down, you know, saw my dad. And I still didn't get the closure I wanted. But he did say his little compelling little piece. And um, went down to New Orleans and met Desmond. And I was kind of lured through some lies a little bit with his mom, but, you know, it is what it is. We're not worried about that either. So it was just focusing with um, training, running, and then found a gym down there. Uh, Henry Wade took me under his wing, but he didn't really give me the energy that I wanted because there was Marcus McDaniel, which is the, uh, now he's a state champion, middleweight state champion now, sort of my nemesis and, He's, you know, he put a lot of energy behind that guy. And then, you know, everybody want to tug at Marcus' uh, coattail because he's, you know, a raw talent. He has a manager. And, you know, he has people said that they're training him. But, you know, who is this real trainer? You know, you had this old man um, saying that they they train him. Then you have this guy saying he's training him. Then you have Henry saying he's training him. Like, wow, you know. And then Henry trained me every once in a while. And I'm sparring, getting busted up by Marcus. And, you know, I'm getting busted up by um, Scooby. And, getting, you know, I'm getting busted up, not feeling the great energy. was just not there. You know, uh, still trying to do my best and not give up. Getting jucked and jive here and there. Trying to get, get my license. Um, met Chase Dixon, who's the key to me losing weight. Breaking me out of my plateau. He was awesome. Then there was beef between uh, Chase and Henry, which was crazy. And that wasn't in the documentary, but all that was kind of deep. You know, all that led up to me not being with Henry no more. And, and I stuck with Chase, you know, and Chase got me. and met, met I met Spider, which is the, my final coach. And Spider was the uplifting that I needed for my career because the positivity he had, he and he took what I had and he worked with it and I felt better. I felt comfortable. His gym was small, but his gym was what I needed. And I came to my own and honed my skills in his gym. I felt a whole lot better in his gym. I didn't feel pressure in his gym. I didn't feel like I had, I didn't feel that need to impress nobody. Just be me. And that was powerful. And it resonated with everybody who see the documentary. You can see the difference between the three trainers that I had. My first trainer, Bob, he, I guess he was just trying to deter me from turning pro and got me knocked out. See if I really, really wanted this game and really wanted to be in boxing, you know, which is cool. He had some good per points in training me, but he really didn't work with me on the mitts or nothing like that. He was more of a... Mo- do this, do that, do this, do that, run, this, that, these nose, you know, trying to get me into shape, losing that weight. And the times I did spar against those amateurs, I was still getting, you know, dinked up a little bit, but not as much because they were amateurs. So I was really holding my own versus the amateurs. But when I got knocked out by Lloyd, that was a whole different thing, you know, that made me really assess, like, is this something I really want to do? But, of course, I don't give up and I stuck with it. Ended up his gym got closed out anyway in California. That's what, what led me to go to L, to New Orleans anyway. I was like, you know what? 
my son is in New Orleans. Um, I, there's a good gym down there. I want to rebuild my son. I'm eight hours from my other son, who I have custody of now. And his mom didn't want him to be a part of the documentary, period, which was jacked up. But I have custody of him now. But going down there and I said, you know, I'm going to be down there. I want to be around my sons because I'm close to them and I want to build with them. And I don't want him to feel what I felt when I met my dad when I was young. And my dad left and I really wanted him in my life. That that took a toll on me. So leaving him to go back to California, leaving my son Desmond to go back to California, that that didn't feel that didn't sit well with me. That's why I told Brad, like, man, we had to go down to New Orleans to finish this documentary. And, you know, Brad didn't give me no lip. I know he probably didn't want to agree to it, but we did. We went down there, we drove from California to New Orleans, got into the hotel, and stayed into, in the hotel for a whole year. You know, Trish came into my life, my girl. She came into my life in, bet- in between the... She was there for, in the inception of when the bell rang. She was there the entire process, but I didn't make her my girlfriend until, like, late 2013. Um, Yeah, right, late 2013, because I just felt that you know, she's the only one that supported me through this whole journey. She's the only one that gives me the, the love and the support and the respect through this entire journey out of all the women I ever dated. So I felt that it was only right that she'd be my queen. Besides, like, it's an ideal love story anyway, because if you listen to the earlier podcast, you know, that I have, that the, our history is from when we were young. I mean, I was 19. She was... 17 or 18 or something like that and we was in this uh GED school to get our GEDs and you know it was uh it was it was like love at first sight for me but it wasn't for her I was a thug and she wasn't I thought she was a thug the way she wore that bandana <laughs> but anyway so then after all that you know, she left after I told her I love her. We know some little other things transpired, and she, I didn't see her until 20 some years later. And look at us now, you know, it's like, wow, she has four kids and, you know, strong, and I have same four kids, strong, you know. So rest in peace, Orlando, my oldest son died last year heinously well anyway i just feel like uh this this is a this is a good journey and i I like talking when the bell rings because i want to motivate these kids to let them know like if you set your mind to something do not give up you don't need to don't put that seed of giving up or doubt or somebody doubted you and they playing that doubt don't fall don't cave into the doubt that's crazy move forward and do your thing I've been through so much in life, you know, running the streets with knuckleheads and, you know, doing stuff. Oh, man, let's go take this break into this car or let's steal this car. You know, that shit, that shit seemed like it's cool, you know, or let's hit that gas station. Okay, that seemed like it's cool, but that shit's detrimental. It's going to get you jacked up. You know, you're going to be in jail doing stupidity. Like, my son got suspended for fighting, you know. I encourage my son. Now, don't get me wrong now. I say, if somebody put their hands on you, beat the shit out of them, you know, but if they just yelling or, or I mean, if somebody hits you, I don't care if he shove you, whatever, be a man, don't, don't lose your temper, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? He shoves you, whatever, that's in your personal space, you shove back, but if he punch you and he hits you, you beat the shit out of him. That's, that's my, that's what, that's what I said, you know, Desmond, my son, he got suspended school Monday and he went back to school today for the first time since Monday and um for fighting and he busted his dude in the mouth and knocked his knocked his tooth up his gum or whatever how it happened. You know. Now my son, does he have a temper? Maybe. I had a temper when I was young. I had a, a hellacious temper. My mom can tell you, my father can tell you, my sister can tell you my relatives can tell you that I had I had a heated temper. Yeah, I had to do a lot to learn. Boxing kind of suppressed that. And just going to anger management classes when I was younger helped out. So 
I had a, a, a vicious temper, actually. That's why I, I joined us, ran with the gangs, and did stupid shit to to release a lot of anger I had. I was very mad at, and my father said, I was mad at the world. Pfft. I think I was mad at the world. I was more pissed at him more than anything. And that's what I feared for my boys. That's why I wanted to be in their life more because I didn't want them to resent me, hate me, and I didn't want them going out there lashing out on other people because of me. You know? Like, both my boys want me to be back with their moms, but, you know, they're living their lives. One is married, and the other one is doing her doing their thing. And I sometimes I believe my ex-wife want me back, but I just don't, I can't go backwards. I don't, I can't do it. I just move forward. We can be the best of friends. I make sure y'all are taken care of, but uh, the relationship thing is not going to happen. I t- explained to my boys, they're like, look, what we had was cool. You know, I missed them back, back then, but they wasn't supportive enough for me, for me even to think about getting back with them. You know, and my girl, she be thinking, you know, sometimes she feel that she's in the way of me trying to make something to make something work with them but no she's never in the way and I would never do that just not doing it just can't go backwards you know yeah I had this thing I wanted to be back with my youngest son mom at one point but Trish woke me up from that I had a thing I wanted to get back with my second baby mama which is my son's mom who I have custody of because I still have her name tattooed on my arm I thought in all this journey I was going to get back with her you know, because the life we had, we really didn't have a real bad breakup. She just wasn't supportive. But we really didn't have a stupid, stupid breakup. It was just some misunderstandings. And the way she, her mind frame is, she's from New York. And, you know, it's her way or no way, her thinking. And just with all that going on, with that friction between, you know, me playing video games and, you know, just some other things that kind of pissed her off about me. We just fell apart. It is what it, that is what it is. But I always loved her, and I had her name on my arm, so I always thought we was gonna get back together. But it never happened. So, fuck it. I have a woman now, and maybe she realized at times we had conversations in the past, and she twisted my conversations against me a, a few times, you know. And she realized that I'm not a bad guy. I was never a bad guy, you know, never a bad guy. I still respect her. She hates my guts, but I respect her. I respect all my kids' moms. You know what I mean? All three of them. My ex-wife, my second baby mom, my last one. I respect my last one. I hated my last one for how we fell apart with the blatant disrespect, the blatant dis... I don't know. I just I don't know what it was. It just that last one, was. it was the worst... It was rough. And then the five or four relationships after my last baby mama was all shitty. And, I, you know, because I was always rebounding relationship out of relationship, get in, out one, get in, out one, you know, and I was I had to stop that trend, you know, and then this relationship I'm in now, you know, I'm just feeling some type of way because of my past and journey and she has her past and journey and we mesh together everything is great but we do have issues still you know we ain't had none lately which is great i'm enjoying it but you can't never negate your past she can't negate her past i can't negate mine but we've learned a lot to overcome bullshit now like i said i'm not a perfect man i'm not perfect i would never be perfect i am perfectly imperfect and I know she's not perfect either, but at the same time, I know I ain't perfect. You know, actually, I'm a I'm a I'm a man that that builds off of energy and love energy. I'm a I'm a totally different type. She there's a lot of things that my girl don't understand about me, but I suppress a lot of my stuff, and that's what makes me. I'm sitting here like a a lion in a cage, just sitting here. You know how you have a lion that you had a lion in the wilderness doing his king shit doing this thing, hunting and, you know, fucking and doing what he does, you know, ruling his territory. And then you take that lion out of his territory, you put that lion in a cage, you know, you put him in a 32 by 32 cage and he just walking around in circles, 
you know what I mean, pissed off because he's in a cage. He can't do what he used to do anymore, you know what I mean? Pissed off because he's doing it. Now, I'm not you reflecting this in my relationship with my girl now. This is not nowhere is that. I'm just saying me in general, how I changed my life from how I used to live to where I'm at, you know, jumping in, in and out of relationships. So you have a, cage, a lion in a cage, pissed off, and then you go, happen to go off in that cage to feed that lion. And that lion is already pissed off. That lion is going to use you as mincemeat. <laughs> that lion is going to, if you release that lion, that lion is going to go wild back to what he used to do or whatever. Now, I say that as an, a metaphor slash analogy slash, uh, uh, I know it's not a uh, simile. So it could be a simile too at the same time. But I use that because I feel that. I didn't do the things I want to do when I was single because I was always in and out of in and out of relationships. Now, I worked at a club called the Country Club at one point, and I learned to that opened my eyes up to a lot, but it was more of a hindrance to me, and it was a hindrance to my growth. That's why I'm glad I'm not there anymore. And it was a hindrance to my relationship, too. With my girl, because I'm around naked people all day. The, sh- the club was a nice club. Where you can come out and be naked. You, you just food and drinks and things and stuff like that, you know. But they, it's not naked. It's not a nude place anymore. That they, they long since changed their their policies due to some situations. But at the same time, it was a fun atmosphere at the time. But it was kind of annoying because you can't be in a relationship while you're working at a place, you know, because it it will it will really take a toll on a relationship. And so that's why I say I'm glad I'm not there anymore. Um, I ain't saying that it took a toll on the rela- my relationship with my girl or whatever, but it just mentally for me, seeing all them ass and titties out there, and I couldn't do nothing because <laughs> you know I'm a faithful man, but shit, like I said, not perfect, you know, perfectly imperfect. And it is what it is. So with that being said, my journey is what it is. I've learned a lot. I learned a lot through relationships. I learned a lot through friendship. I learned a lot from not doing all that dark shit in the streets. I learned a lot from the death of my girlfriend 20 odd years ago. You know what I mean? I learned a lot from my boxing career. That was once on top of his game. And then it just had a tremendous downfall. You know. I'm thinking like man. I was on top of my game. Now you have people that's on top of their game. Like the Montel Griffins. And the Roy Jones. And the Mayweathers. And the uh, Jane Tonys. And the Michael Nunns. And the the Sweet Peas. And the the Phoenix Trillidads. And the you know saying the Pacquiao's. All of them on top of their game. They did their thing. They went to the Olympics. So some of them did or didn't. You know, doing their thing, the Chris Birds and, you know, all those guys doing their thing. And look where they're at today, where I was in the voice of them in the beginning. I'm in that same circle group of of eliteness at one point in the beginning part, building myself up to that. Then to meet my son's mom and have a straight downfall after that. You know what I mean? I met my son's mom and that my coach, Butch Elliott, words ring through my head to this day and it echoes my in my head. She's going to be the downfall of your career. That's what he told me. And I allowed that to happen. That shit ate me alive and alive and alive and alive. Man, it really ate me alive. But everything happens for a reason. Maybe if I was boxing all that, because I was a beast, I didn't get hit much. It's maybe I, the wear and tear would have took a toll on me eventually. Just the training and the, you know, the fighting, and you know, eventually I probably would have started getting hit more or whatever. I don't know. Because I didn't get hit much back then. I was just that that good. But now, as I think about it, everything in life happens for a reason. I'm in this position in my life now to inspire others, to open their mind, to to steer and help guide people from that wrong path and keep them on a straight path to greatness. 
that's what the mission and my and helping my sons do the same thing as well as my daughter well it's been fun i didn't i've been talking for 36 minutes and 12 seconds it's the longest because I'm, I'm passionate about my story i'm passionate about helping i'm passionate about life i'm passionate about love i love my girl you know what i mean i love women but i love my girl i love women in general but my girl is, I'm growing old with her. And we're going to open, we're going to do some great things. You know what I mean? I love her family. I love her daughters. I love her sons. I love her siblings. I love her style. You know? I love her willingness to, to get to know me. But there's a lot of things about me she can't, she doesn't like or doesn't accept. But it is what it is. You know? It's just that gap. We're still closing that 20 some year gap to mesh as one. So I know that there's things in my past I can't I can't do with my with my baby now. Does it hurt? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but at the same time, though, she gonna listen to this, she's gonna like, um, so what are you talking about, babe? What does that mean? And what does this mean? And what does that mean? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. But hey, that's life. And then he was like, hmm. Breaking news. Breaking news. Breaking news. Dino love Trish Jackson. <laughs> yeah. That's all. I didn't say nothing else. So, with that being said, everybody. You know what that mean? It's time to leave the show. Outro, baby. Thank you all for coming on. Google me. Dino Wells. I'm on all social media. www.ismyurls.com forward slash Dino Wells. Yeah. At Dino Wells on Twitter. Catch me on Snapchat. Dino underscore Wells. Alright. This is my track right here. Yeah, I made this. Much love to y'all. Yeah. Thank y'all.